getting a little bit of a late start, but that's okay. So I'm going to just initially have some opening remarks, um, and then I'm going to introduce myself, and then we'll just go down the line. I have a slide for each of you. you oh, wow. Okay. Introduce, you can say whatever the hell you want, really, but, you know. All right, everyone. It is 5.05, and people are actually stopping finally, uh, filing in. Um, so welcome to Designing a Procedurally Generated Game. I hope you've been having a good pass. We have an amazing set of panelists today. So I called this uh, meeting of like minds together uh, because I'm currently embedded in uh, the design of Moon Hunters, uh, which is the second game from Kit Fox Games. And we're, our, our ambition initially was to procedurally generate mythologies. Um, and we're, we're getting there. We're procedurally generating something anyway. Um, and, and that's why I, I'm obsessed with this and decided it would be really fun, probably for you and me too, to hear uh, these designers discuss uh, their own thoughts on designing procedural generations. OK. My name's Keppa. I've been making games for about six years now. And um, I'm working on three games, or publishing three games right now, and they're all procedurally generated. There's Death Road to Canada out there. It's a game about a road trip from Florida to Canada, where you have a bunch of, you, you pick up people like hitchhikers and such, or fine people, and they're all jerks, and you're trying to hold your group together for just a little bit during choose your own adventure style events. And then that's mixed in with um, action adventure, fighting 100, 200 zombies at a time as they slowly creep towards you segments. And then we're working on a game called Dad by the Sword about your dad running around in jean shorts, <laughs> slicing up anti-dads with a claymore. <laughs> I'm being serious about all these games, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're working on a couple more, and we've recently released Wayward Souls, which was once again procedurally generated. Cool. Uh, my name is Tyler. Um, I'm the game designer for Darkest Dungeon. Woo! And, uh, Oh my gosh. Uh, which I like to think of as a procedural stress generator for me. Because uh, every day you don't know what you're going to get. And generally, you know, random amounts of stress. Um, That's all games, though. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's specific Darkest Dungeon. But, um, so it's got some roguelike elements, you know, which we can get into. So there's some procedural stuff there, and then some of the stuff we're doing with Heroes. Um, but, you know, I, I love that kind of like systems based games, and I also love like done some design of board and, and tabletop games and things like that. And so I always think of like advanced hero quest where it's like, oh, roll d6, okay, lay a, lay a quarter. Now it's a junction, you know, um, as its basic simple form. But uh, I'm Tarn. Uh, I uh, make a dwarf fortress. <laughs> Uh, to the few of you out there, I need to explain this to you. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, we, we aspire to kind of have this sort of fantasy world generator and makes a, um, you know, a map with mountains and forests and, and so on, runs a history for a few hundred years if your computer can hack it. And, uh, and then uh, you play a little colony of dwarves. Uh, they all have their little personalities and other, other things going on. We procedurally generate everything. That's kind of uh, what we do. Um, just to try and get you know, s stories to pop up, a game we can play ourselves, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'll move on. I'm Ryan Clark, and I love Dwarf Fortress. <laughs> 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 Which is true. But I, uh, I am Ryan Clark, the designer of Crypt of the Necrodancer, which is a dungeon calling rhythm game. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dance party following this panel. <laughs> yeah. So if you haven't played it, it's a roguelike rhythm game where you have to move on the beat of the music to fight enemies and pick up loot and buy things in the shop and whatnot. And uh, yeah, all the levels and enemies and items and stuff are procedurally generated. Cool. So that's us. And what's going to happen now is that I'm going to chat with them for 30, 40 minutes. And then at the end, well, I guess more like 20, 30 minutes at this point. Um, I'll, I'll put out a call for people who want to ask their own questions. Uh, we'll only have like 10 or 15 minutes for that. Uh, but those of you that don't have time, uh, we will be sticking around afterwards. So uh, everyone, uh, why, why do you do procedural generation? What, what is the appeal? Why not just write everything about the game and then have it actually work all the time? <laughs> <laughs> Too easy. I, I do it because I think uh, 
it makes it so that when you play the game the first time, you, you're not aware of everything. So it's like it's not obvious what this game is until you play it over and over again and start to feel the kind of like meta rules that, that make up the game. So like when we're when we're programming it, all those different rules that we put in that generate stuff, people won't understand those right away. But when they play it a bunch of times, they start to get it. So I think it's it's an entirely different game that's kind of like life. Like when you're doing things in real life, if you start a new job or something like that, you don't really know, you know how that environment works, but you, you figure it out over multiple days. So um, in, in, in Crypto the Necrodancer, that sort of stuff happened uh, by accident a few different times. Like uh, in our zone one, when you, uh, when you try and find the exit, it's usually kind of down and to the right. And that was an accident. We didn't actually put that in there on purpose. But I found it after playing it a bunch of different times that it seemed to be, it's never top, top left. It's always kind of down, down rightish or maybe down or right. Um, and after you play that a bunch of times, you realize that this is, this is how it feels. But that gives you an advantage when you're speed running. And it's cool to like discover that um, over multiple plays. It makes you feel like you've gained some mastery. And you know, non-procedural games, you can't have that kind of feeling. Yeah, I mean, we 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 do it. Just uh, I mean, I, uh, we didn't. My brother, I always say we. <laughs> Zach's out there somewhere. Um, so we we just we just uh, uh, didn't have like a lot of people that we knew playing computer games growing up, and it's a way for the developer to surprise themselves. I mean, it's completely kind of selfish or whatever, but that's the that's the reason we do it. Uh, and but then the surprise. I mean, people that play the game, they can be surprised too and play it play it over and over and over. Uh, with uh, and see new things every time, and uh, it's it's um, I mean just sitting and and writing a a kind of scripted story. It's 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 hard to play that kind of game yourself, and uh, people it's a little harder for people to talk about it too. Um, is when you when you when you actually have people out there playing your game, you get to see like the real amazing thing about procedural generation is that everyone can kind of see a different angle of the game, and uh, you can have um, just it, it, it creates a whole sort of community around uh, around around what's going on. That's that's really special. And they yeah. kind of talk about it in terms of stories and things like that, rather than mechanics. Nobody ever really talks about the different things that you you can kind of do with your dwarves. They talk about what happened to them, crazy things. So it's different different from other games. I feel like the fact that they're figuring things out also makes them feel more involved mm -hmm. and more excited about what happened because they're figuring it out. It's not being told to them. And you can actually discover things like other games where everything is placed by hand. Um, you know, you're, you're discovering a thing that the designer specifically did, but with a particularly generated game, you can make like a real discovery that nobody knows. I guess maybe the internet spoiled that for people. Because <laughs> <laughs> so you used to be able to find things in games. Yeah. Like yeah, you, it, you could at least pretend no one else could that. Yep. Yeah, the old, like, did you know that this part of Super you can jump up and there's a hidden one? Yep. Now you just immediately go, day one, there's a guy, and you don't have to do any effort to actually discover anything. Mm -hmm. For Yeah, for me, it's, it's similar from a design perspective. I think of, uh, um, I just get really bored. Um, Personally, like if I'm going to hand place everything and then I know exactly what's there, there's no surprise. So it's a little bit for my own enjoyment, but um, I don't mind so much consuming scripted content. Like if something, you know, it's like a movie. I love it when this <laughs> care and attention has gone into creating something, but but I guess I'm a systems designer, so I, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I guess you just start doing the things that are soothing to you. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of also making a game that I would enjoy personally and kind of being being surprised as that goes. It just feels like it, it, it toggles a different part of the brain to be thinking of like discovering possibilities as opposed to just um, placing every single thing. And then that stresses me out way more than the idea of kind of playing in a sandbox of, of systems, so. Yeah, I wanted to get into procedural generation because I've always had the dream of making a game that outlives me. By that, like people are playing it after I'm, you know, dead in the ground, and I think procedural generation is a huge part of that. I think it's also cool that that you don't, if it's a procedural game, you often won't get sick of your own game. At least not not as much. Like I've made puzzle games and stuff in the past, and like I can't go solve my own puzzles. That's not fun. It, it definitely makes like a year of play testing easier on the yeah, developer. Yeah, because you're actually playing it. Like whenever we added a new zone to Necrodancer, I was excited because I actually got to play my game and you know see what these enemies were going to do to me and stuff it was it was really fun so um, but yeah if you're if you're designing puzzles and things like that or an adventure game it's not going to be exciting and to you that might be a huge part of it i mean we're all small teams relatively like we have to do our own quality assurance uh, much more than some of the bigger studios which you just design content send it off and someone will let you know if there's something wrong 
which we can't really do. Yeah, and the <laughs> perspective of, uh, I think, like, when you're designing a puzzle, you, you you have to rely on outside feedback for the perspective of, like, is it working? Yep. Because you know exactly exactly what the three items to grab and sequence them, so that takes you 20 seconds, you know, where they are. Um, and I suppose I don't really want to rely all through development on other people coming in and saying, oh, that seems a bit long. I mean, it's good to have feedback, but... Yep. Doing that, those iterations where you're just working on it yourself, it's really nice to be just, yeah. The, essentially, procedural systems relegate you to a player role as though you're not even a dev. Yeah, way. yeah. I think when you're designing stuff, normally you often like have to imagine what the the player is going to feel, mm -hmm. um, especially with puzzle games and things like that. Like, what are they going to feel when they get to these different parts? But with a procedural game, you don't have to imagine because you can yeah. you can play it just like they do, right? And you don't know in the same way that they don't know what's Another thing I really like along those lines is that it's very easy to integrate things without everything else breaking. Mm. Well. What? <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> wow. I want to work on your games. <laughs> um, is there anything that you, you either wish you hadn't proc gen or it, it seems tempting to, uh, to not do so? Like any element you've been avoiding because of proc gen or I don't know, anything along those lines? Like is there, are there things that, that lend themselves better to procedural generation? So for us, for room design, we originally tried to figure out how to design every nook and cranny in the walls. And then uh, Darius Kazemi did an article about how the procedural generation in Spelunky works. And how that works is, instead of having like every single tile be placed by code, what Spelunky does is just have a bunch of um, hand-drawn rooms. And I think it's about like 30 rooms per area type or something. Yeah. But then there's slight variations in those. So unless someone tells you that there's only 30 variations, you'll never, it'll take a long time for you to figure out all the variations. So yeah, we, we pretty much took the Spelunky method where we do handcrafted content and then there's a lot of variations per room. And I think no one really cares. Like if you do, <laughs> if you make like the best room generator in the world so it makes like correct walls constantly, no one will notice or care, so it's just uh, Good job, you made a wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can just vouch for the fact that putting tiles down is a complete nightmare. I mean, you, you have, especially when you're dealing in uh, three dimensions, mm -hmm. you get, you just screw up one variable, one place, one minus sign or whatever, and then you might go back and, and look at your maps, and they're fine, and then you look again, and they're fine, and then once 10,000 people are playing or something, there'll be about 100 of them that get the right configuration where it's just totally wrong and opens a floor in the ground that goes down 10,000 blocks and lava's bubbling up and so on. Would that be a so bugger feature for Dwarf Fortress? <laughs> uh, it's all the same. I mean, if people enjoy themselves for a while, we just take a time fixing the problem. <laughs> you know, it's, it's we, I mean, we did some things like we uh, consciously haven't done items. Um, which is sort of ironic because we've actually, so we're hand designing our items and then we've spent the least amount of time on them. Like it's coming, it's on the schedule, we're gonna, so it's kind of funny that we're not proc genning the items, but then we've cocked up the items like all manner of, of ways. So we should have just proc gen them. But we just didn't want random, like, I was getting a little tired of, of some of, from a playing perspective, the, the fierce crying knife of the monkey. Yeah, like at the first whale, yeah. that was so cool when people started doing that. But now it's almost expected that you should have a, 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 a procedural item system that appends all the prefixes and suffixes. And then I find now, like I see through it, it's like seeing it's taking some of the the mystery away from it. You're like, oh, well, this is like plus five in the moonlight and this. Um, so we want to like handcraft our items, and then we. Well, that's the only way to have them really like system driven items the way mm -hmm. that like the items are in Crypt of the Necrodancer They're all hand handmade, right? Yep. Yes. yes, yes. Same. Yeah. It's it's the Borderlands problem where <laughs> Borderlands had like the uh, what was it? 18 million guns yes. ad and then oh. it turns out like five guns matter <laughs> at the end. But you get plus 0.5 percent. <laughs> it's, it's a good marketing thing. Definitely. <laughs> I mean naming them too, you know, so even if we did end up you, you do end up templatizing even if you're hand designing them you're like, okay, well this isn't gonna bonus crit but we didn't want to always have to call the bonus to crit one the of you know of whatever it'd be nice we could actually name it whatever we want so for us the language and the theme and the immersion is like incredibly important to the game the um, so in that case I think like if you see through to all the underlying systems is what they are it breaks a little bit of the spell of, of for darkest dungeon specifically um, 
Well, it's kind of like the opposite of figuring stuff out, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, we all know the suffix prefix system at this point, so. Yeah, I mean, and to get beyond that, you need to build systems that live underneath it so that if you're like, like, I mean, a simple example would be like the material system. Like, if, if your materials matter in some way and, and materials interact with each other, mm -hmm. then finding an iron sword means something more than mm. finding like a sword of the rat or whatever, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And so to think of how you do deal with enchanted items, then you'd have to conceive of a system that actually had magic integrated into the rest of the world and then you've got a project on your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone please do that. So we, we had a problem where we didn't procedurally generate something that we should have. The, the bosses in Necrodancer at first were not, not like super random, not super varied. Um, the number of different setups there could be was very small. And so you could kind of memorize like, OK, if I'm going into this boss battle with a broadsword, then I do this pattern and I win. And if I'm going in with a rapier, then I do this pattern and I win. And so the bosses became actually too easy for people, for people who you know studied the bosses, you know, you think of a boss as, as like a challenging, hard thing that happens at the end, but for them it became kind of like a break, like, okay, I survived those <laughs> other things, I just got to the boss, now I just do this. And so, so I actually uh, changed it to make it so that there were more, more variations, and that, that, that pissed some people off, um, so <laughs> <laughs> because the bosses were suddenly a lot harder. And you can still, you know, learn all the permutations if you want to, but it's just, you know, a heck of a lot more of them, but it makes people have to improvise more, which I think is, is more fun. I just wanted a break, right? <laughs> Your break. Um, so, what kind of advice would you give to a designer that's starting out in proc gen? Like, oh. let's say you're a designer and you're working on your very first procedurally generated game. Um, my advice uh, would be to go for it. Definitely <laughs> do it. <laughs> Um, but just be aware of uh, the blandness effect, which I'm sure you all can, can talk about at, at length, but uh, just be aware of putting in so many rules that it's always the same, because uh, that's definitely what happened with my first experiment. My advice would be to anyone starting out would be to rip off Spelunky. <laughs> 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 or, yeah, other games really helped, because uh, for my really old games, Hook Champ, I wanted to do a randomly generated version of Hook Champ, like first thing, much like I wanted uh, the predecessor to Wayward Souls to be randomly generated, but I couldn't get into it. I couldn't figure it out. So uh, Darius Kazemi's article about Spelunky really helped me out a ton. And also, um, I think Cannibalt helped me a lot because he did his random generation really simply for his Endless Runner. It was just, uh, once again, pretty much handcrafted sections with altitude changes, I think. So yeah, borrow from other developers and then put your own spin on it. I, I think um, and this sounds really... I, almost ashamed of myself saying this uh, next to the Dwarf Fortress uh, creator. But um, <laughs> you can get a lot done, start really simple systems. I, I think the beauty, for me at least, in working on like systems like this is it's the layering of the systems together that creates really complex behavior sometimes. And you don't necessarily, unless that's goal and that's really central to whatever your game idea is, you don't have to get crazy complicated to end up with something that is really you know, surprising and interesting and complex as a, as a whole. Um, some of the neatest kind of emergent behavior I've seen is from a series of really bone simple systems underneath that when layered together, uh, you know, it's just like you, you almost can't see the, see the underlying systems anymore. So you can make really simple stuff. You don't have to feel like you need to get a PhD in math to, to you know, create the world's best blank generator. Um, just start with simple, you can simulate on a spreadsheet you know, and do all kinds of cool stuff. And then as you layer stuff in and tweak variables, that's where the life of it, you know, that's where it really, um, the life gets breathed into it. I think a lot of starting designers uh, get really wrapped up in the, the thought of their game, like the idea of their game, and they don't just leap in there when they should. And instead, yeah, they start writing for hours and hours and hours. Like they have this amazing concept for a game, and then it's like way overwhelming, and then they can't make that game anymore. Um, and it's really sad. It happens with programmers too, right? Programs can tend to over-specify, try and come up with the perfect algorithm, and they haven't started yet. And uh, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with anything uh, Tyler said about this because uh, I mean, Dwarf Fortress doesn't actually have very complicated simulations. It's just a lot of very small, simple things built up over 
you know, what, Eons. 15 years or whatever. Yeah, so it's just they, 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 you stack them on top of each other. They interact with each other in ways that you haven't thought about, but you just kind of have to control for as they break. And you'll eventually have something really interesting going on. I mean, in terms of starting out, uh, I, I would recommend people to just just start on a on a on a small simple project that you kind of have in your head what's going on. What about a tablet? I mean, that's what I end up doing most of the time when I start a new system is take a tablet, draw what I want to do. If I had like like a town generator or something, uh, go on the internet, look at maps of they're kind of like the towns I want to make, and then just draw them and then. When I and then draw a new one, and and when I when I see a, one that I've drawn that looks right, I was like, what are the steps that I had in my head when I was drawing it? Did I lay out lay out the roads first? Did I try and say where the large structures were first? Did I care more about not making it look too square? And just when, once you can draw several times what your vision is, you'll kind of get a feel for what algorithmically is going on. And you don't need to, it helps over time, but you don't need to study like, um, you know, how does Perlin noise work or, or, or how does, um, you know, Fourier transforms or whatever you want to end up using. Uh, you don't need to understand any of that. Um, it's best just to dive in, get something on the screen that you can tweak and have a kind of semi-playable uh, uh, project so that you can just iterate over and over. I mean, we're all into iteration here. We were talking about that before. Just the uh, the the there's not going to be some perfect algorithm. You're just going to get to close enough, and it'll be fine uh, once you get there. I think for that blandness problem that you were talking about, Tanya, it's probably because people often, when they're thinking about procedurally generated games or designing one, they think about like the world and how it's going to look and how it's all going to be, but they don't. I think you should focus more on like. What, what are the events, what are the things that are going to happen, and how, you know, what rules you need to set up in order to make those cool things happen? Like, isn't that what, what you do? You guys talk about, like, oh, yeah. these are neat things that we'd like to be able to do in the game. Yeah, I mean, and the, then the, what do we need to do to our, make it? Our principal way of planning was just to write down little fantasy stories. It's like, oh, this is great, and then just look at, you know, when, just reading one sentence out of, out of some fantasy novel, the implications are huge. <laughs> you need all kinds of stuff uh, just to say, like, you know, the, the, the Conan got on the boat and started arguing with somebody <laughs> about a camel or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it's just, there's, there's ev all of the implications there about what you'd actually need to make that happen without being scripted. Uh, you could just start listing them off, right? And, and then you'd have a, you know, a set of systems to work on for a couple of years or whatever. So it's yeah, and by default, it's going to do interesting things because that's yeah. a pretty cool thing for you know, a, a character in a game to want to do, get on a boat with a camel. Like they have yeah. a desire to go on a boat, and he knows about camels and can tame them. <laughs> Was it a boat with a camel or a boat with an argument with a camel? Oh, the <laughs> argument, yeah. Okay. Yeah, commas are important, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Arguing with camels would be funny, too, because he's kind of crazy. He argues with a camel. Like that would be a cool thing to have in a game. And yeah. you may not even have water in your game yet, so there. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I just have ponds right now, so I guess we better have oceans because yeah. it'd be silly to have a. It's best to handcraft your water. You For them to talk at all, you'd have to generate a tire of pressure. Do you, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that you you draw your town, or for example, towns mm -hmm. on paper, because we definitely also build a hand built like prototype, like looking at like, okay, what does it should the game actually feel like. Um, in order to reverse engineer how to make yeah. that happen. It's kind of like concept art for procedural yeah. generation, right? It's yeah. Like, it, even for a scripted game, you'd, you'd want to see what you've got so that you can have a feel for what you should add. Do you guys do that at all? No? Well, yeah, I mean, a, a little bit because of, uh, I think, the paper game roots, too. I, I think uh, inspiration for simple procedural systems are, you know, looking at the old DMGs and stuff like that, if any of you are paper gamers which I'm sure some of you are. Um, you know, and there's, so there's, a lot, there's been a lot of role-playing games over the years that have had, by necessity, pretty simple systems for procedural content generation. D6, D8, D10, 2D6, you know, and I, I find it's really helpful to think in terms of those things because, um, you know, if you've been playing a lot of D&D, &D, then you kind of know what 1D6 versus 2D6 versus 3D6, how those distributions might work, or... Um, you know, so we'll talk internally a lot of times about, uh, I guess this is just a little bit of systems design, but in terms of, you know, D10. So I guess we could say it's, it's actually a, a percentage system, but we're restraining to the, mm -hmm. mm. the quadrants or whatever. But, um, so, you know, it's, again, getting back to that, like, HeroQuest or something of, 
Well, there's a one in six chance it's gonna be a left fork, and a one in six chance it's gonna be a right fork, and a one in six chance it's gonna be a T. So that's how simple the systems systems can be to get something up and running. So I think I visualize as paper games, yeah, rather than, than something else. But there's more and more cool board games coming out with interesting, mm -hmm. like really elegant procedural generation in their content as well. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, we did it a little different for Necrodancer. I didn't draw like what I wanted the, the zones to look like or anything. It was it was based on the way that the combat works, um, increasing the level of difficulty. So in zone one, there are like hallways that are kind of narrow, and it's easier to fight enemies if they're coming at you single file and if, if it's in a narrow area. Um, so then to up the difficulty a bit for zone two, I made the hallways kind of wider so that more enemies can come at you at once. And then zone three is like cavernous so they can come at you from all directions. Um, and then zone four, we did even crueler things. Um, so yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't so much drawing. It was based on yeah, the, the difficulty ramp, how it had to be. Um, is there anything that you feel like like maybe some people get wrong often, either in their first uh, attempts or, um, I don't know, maybe procedural generation uh, examples that, uh, that intrigue you in an unpleasant way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've definitely seen some games where like you were saying, it's, it's bland, it's like a big wide open world and at first it seems amazing, like it's huge, there's so much, so many possibilities, but then you walk around and it's not that much stuff to do, so that's why I was suggesting that people should think about what, what are the fun things that could happen and design around that. Yeah, procedural doesn't necessarily mean expansive, and I think like that, that's a key. I mean, I remember back from Daggerfall, when Daggerfall came out and, you know, the sequel to it. <laughs> so we're going with, you know, pre-Skyrim by like three or four genera you know, generations of the same series. But one of the back-of-the-box bullet, you know, sales points was like over X, you know, dozens and dozens of villages and so many square kilometers or miles. You know, and that's really exciting. And we still see that. It's funny because that same stuff, um, I mean, No Man's Sky is selling the same dream, right? Like so big that the possibilities are limitless. Um, but then when I was playing Daggerfall, it was kind of like every village looks the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing unique uh, about each individual place. And so I think that's that's the danger of just because you have the power of the computer and you're, you know, yeah. with one click you can do, you can you can do anything. It's Times still, one million. <laughs> yeah, I think it's better, still better to do like a couple meaningful things than a million, you know. Yeah, I think overall things. Daggerfall is pretty instructive in terms of Things you can do wrong with procedural <laughs> generation. I, I mean, I not. I mean, I wouldn't. I mean, the game is from what ninety six or something, right? Yeah. So you, I mean, you can't. You can't. Uh, that was inspirational. It. Yeah, sure. yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah, it was great. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it did did to kind of carry things forward, but when you when you think you have it was like thousands of actually like towns and different provinces, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. It was there were so many. It was just, but they were all the same. <laughs> but then when you went into the dungeons, that was really interesting because. Uh, like it was like Spelunky, it took modules and glued them together, but they they didn't do the little tweaks and wiggles that you need to do. So, mm -hmm. but but they were they were really happy with like these giant set piece modules with stairs going up and then <laughs> stairs on the side, torches and a skeleton, <laughs> and and then you'd go to the next dungeon over and you'd find that glued in somewhere else. <laughs> and it, it you just I mean in, in, in like a, a roguelite game, it's not a problem going into NetHack and there's a rectangle. And it has different stuff in it, but I mean, a rectangle is a repetitive module, right? But it's it, it doesn't matter. You don't you don't you don't feel like that's part of the immersion of the game. Whereas in Daggerfall, the graphics at the time, it was like this this is why we're here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't I, if they had just done little tweaks, and you can kind of the next step of that would be like these Bloodborne dungeons, right? They have yeah. they have modules. You see the the bridge with the swinging yeah, axes, yeah, yeah. right? Because I don't know. I mean, for people who haven't played it, Bloodborne is a souls type game with fixed levels but then there's these chalice dungeons you can make that are that are procedurally generated from modules but they do they do some things they change the furniture they put fog in this one and not in this one the creatures change it feels like a halfway point to a decent job so if whatever. you can see through to all the lego pieces <laughs> it kind of breaks this, this yeah a bit. yeah and in Spelunky, you really can't. I mean, you, you, you feel like it's the game elements that are the things that you're yeah. being challenged by, and you don't feel like if there's a little pool of water, it feels like its own pool of water. It never feels like... Yeah, and, and even if there's an enemy, even if, for example, there was a, t or a module that had an enemy in the same place, what's around it can dramatically affect your, how you need to deal with that challenge, whereas maybe in that Darefall example, 
that skeleton being right there, there's really no relevance to what's around it. Yeah, really or you, you just learn how to fight it on the stairway the same way every time. Or right. Whatever. right. Uh, is there anything that's particularly uh, challenging for you in the procedure? Like anything that's tripped you up a little bit in uh, your procedural generation explorations and experiments? Yeah, debugging can be really hard sometimes. <laughs> if there's like some weird rare thing that, you know, even if you, even if you have a system where you can put in a seed number and get the same dungeon, if your determinism isn't, you know, exact, then it may not give you the exact same dungeon every time. So there can be things that happen, you know, only to one every millionth play or something, and people will tweet at us, this weird thing happened, like, oh, how am I ever going to figure out? So you end up, like, just looking at code. But it's hard to tell when looking at, like, procedural code what it is about this that makes it so that sometimes the hallways do a weird thing, or the torch yeah. is floating instead of being <laughs> on a wall. Like, we did, we did a seed problem at PAX, actually, the uh, previous PAX, where I realized that I had been designing, trying to really harness procedural generation. So I, I designed a bunch of levels and then kept the seeds of the ones that I wanted to show at PAX because they were the right size and the right shape and they looked nice. And I had done it on a Mac. And then we did <laughs> everything on a PC. Yeah. And so day one was like, you know, first of all, I, of course, blamed the programmers. <laughs> um, you know, and then I blamed someone had brought the wrong build, and then I was like, oh, man. And finally, you know, I figured out that <laughs> I had taken the seeds from the wrong machine. So that's, that was a bummer, but... Yeah, I had the same thing happen. With a, it's, it was a compiler optimization between oh. Mac and PC. Uh -huh. One of them, it took the conditional out, and one of them, it left it in. Uh, and, and so it called a random number one more time. And that's all it takes. I mean, you're going to do a million random numbers if you get out of sequence, because these are all all random numbers on a computer. Actually, it's pseudo random. It's just going through a sequence of random numbers in a particular order, and you just use them how you want. And if you just get one step out of phase, then the whole world looks different, and you, you can't debug someone's uh, code that they send you or whatever. Cool. Well, I mean, what what is next? For you, and and what do you f think is next for like procedural generation? Like, I mean, those are two completely different questions, but uh, <laughs> but maybe not. I don't know. I'm interested to see what Dwarf Fortress is doing next. <laughs> What's Dwarf Fortress doing next? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, so the thing we're currently working on is those uh, these kind of procedural art forms in. I guess the worst possible way you could think about doing it, which is, <laughs> here are some paragraphs describing poetry, here are some paragraphs describing a type of music. I was just, yesterday I, I spent time with like 60, I, I, a timbre, is that how you pronounce it? I know it's like timbre. lingerie, right? It's a difficult word. <laughs> uh, and the timbre uh, words, these are words that are not related to pitch or loudness, but it's like, it's a warm tone, a rich tone, a clear tone, a buzzy tone. And just trying to procedurally generate those for instruments so that they don't conflict with each other and they're <laughs> in nice families and so forth. But the instrument can shift register and it can change some of them, but not all of them and so forth. And then, but you're just reading this about like this is this dwarven instrument that has these traits and there's no no sound at all. <laughs> and so I mean, did we go too far down the rabbit hole? It's, it's always true that we just go yeah. No. So we're I, I, I love the rabbit. I can find you some musicians that I'm sure can uh, <laughs> yeah, procedurally generate. Well, something. The, the, I put up my example paragraphs and the musicians were quite critical of. <laughs> that's why the, that's why the timbre is going in. Actually, we didn't have that before. It's like this is a glass instrument and blah 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 and they're like well what does it sound like or whatever and I'm like, well I can tell you how it sounds I can't show you that <laughs> so for me after I get uh, Death Road of Canada out and Died by the Sword I want to start making more um, procedurally generated sword fighting games and the one after Dad by the Sword and Dad by the Sword's combat is goofy as hell you like hold the left mouse button and you're sticking your arm in, and then you just flop your mouse around and you control it super accurately which makes the game harder <laughs> After that, I want to make um, a horror game that's also a sword fighting game. So, you know, that'll work really well with uh, procedural generation because you can just get shredded all the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm slowly building up money and skill of procedural generation because I want to do a game where uh, you and a group of people are shipped to this, like, uh, island where you're forced to mine artifacts. And it's kind of like um, a company store kind of thing, if you know what I'm talking about like how they used to rip off miners where you had mm. to buy stuff from mining oh, shops. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like this big, never-ending cycle Are you of like oppression. paid by the UN or? <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're getting it for like royalty or something. No, you. So it's like an open world horror game. So that's what I'm a horror procedural game. 
I can go next. I uh, so Moon Hunters is uh, is coming out in January. So we're we're kind of we've resigned to having personality traits that NPCs kind of react to, and the procedural parts are mostly in the world, and then it kind of tells you what you did. Um, but for our next game, we're actually looking at um, simulating people a little bit more interestingly. So we're looking at like spies and like what's interesting about spies and like their motivations for spying for on like for you and on you. <laughs> um, I can't tell you anything more than that, but uh, that that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in procedural people. Yeah, we're just finishing up. Uh getting Necrodancer on PlayStation and Vita and stuff like that, and so we're just getting started on our next game, which will be also a procedural game, but a sim game, not a, not a rhythm game. I know we're disappointing <laughs> some people that it's not going to be a rhythm game, but... But it'll have a great soundtrack, I'm sure. I, yes, <laughs> definitely. But yeah, I think for, for cool stuff that might be next, I don't know if that was your question of like what the sure. industry could do. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have seen that, that Twitter um, account that tweets out procedurally generated magic cards. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. Oh, it's so awesome. I was thinking, it makes me think that there should be more procedurally generated design stuff, because like that is, that's designing cards for you. And it'd be awesome to play a game of magic where a machine actually spits out new, totally new magic cards for you every Wait time. Wait a second, are robots taking our jobs? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's got natural language processing and stuff, and it, it, it looked at the corpus of like all existing magic cards and dissected the, you know, the way that those sentences are formed. And so some of them make total, like no sense at all, which is also fun to read these like <laughs> just word salad stuff that you're like, what the heck is it even trying to say? But some of them like seemed completely legit. So it would be really fun to play you know, a draft where nobody has seen any of the cards before. Because right now, people have an advantage if they've, if they've studied, you know, this next set that came out and they know it way better than you. But if it was all just random, nobody would have any advantage. So, hope there'll be more stuff like that. Hard to do, though. Yeah, I, I'm, as an observer, I'm really interested. I mentioned No Man's Sky earlier. Um, I, th I think that's a very interesting test of, like, the expectations are so high. Um, and they're doing some really interesting stuff, but, um, I think that'll be a test of the, the, the breadth first approach of, not, not that they don't have detailed systems, I just mean the idea of you can go to a million galaxies and maybe one of the cool things they're doing is the idea of I think some of it's persistence. So when you discover something, it's actually relevant to all of our universe. That, that's I think new versus say the Skyrim issue. Um, so as an observer, I'm really interested to see that. Um, personally, it's like weird because um, life is divided right now into finishing Darkest Dungeon and then all the wonderful, amazing things I get to do after like sleep and <laughs> eat and Chris, you know, my partner was just saying, I'm going to take up fire juggling and unicycling and, you know, just while you're dreaming and working on a game, the, the most appealing thing of all is like another game idea you have in the back of your yeah. head. So we've been really, we don't even let ourselves mentally journey there right now. But um, I think within Torcus Dungeon though, there's a lot more. I don't know, I don't know if this will be expansion. Actually it is, yeah. As something we want to do as an expansion, for example, we played with some other mode ideas that would rely more on even procedural generation. Like we procedurally generate our quests right now, but they're quite they're quite simple. Um, and I think it would be fun to do a bit more. And that might be something we do in an expansion or something. Uh, so that'd be fun. And then of course like the idea of thinking of sequels or whatever. It would be fun. And you're you're on the floor here, right? We are, yeah. I think now is the plugging time. Oh really? <laughs> well uh, yeah. you're welcome to yeah come by. We're on level four. Well we're up here in the PAX ten. Uh, and then we're also on level four, right next to Clay, and we're showing off our new dungeon, the Cove. Uh, so if any of you play that one, will be dropping next month. But sorry, I don't want to nope. overplug. But feel free to come by and check out the game. That's good. Um, and Moon Hunters is on the fourth floor as part of the indie mega booth. Um, you can look at uh, we're right next to Below by Cappy, which is awesome. Hopefully they'll join us here next year. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty close to your booth, and I'm showing off uh, Death Road to Canada and Dad by the Sword. <laughs> yeah. And these guys are just hanging out, just, just being chilling. cool. Just just chilling. Chilling. Yeah, Sleeping awesome. in so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. That's the first phase. Oh. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do questions. This is our uh, audience-generated content. Uh, yes, <laughs> it is time for the user-generated content portion of this uh, entertainment. Um, so please, uh, line up, and I'm sorry if you don't get enough time, but please be succinct so we can get as many as possible, and we are not offended by you leaving goodbye. <laughs> yes. Um, could you talk a bit about the difficulty of game balance when you're working with procedurally generated content? Because I know in Crypt of the Necrodancer, you'll have runs where you get like an Obsidian Rapier, first like 1-1, one, one, and then I just like clear the rest of the game super easy, and then sometimes you 
have the dagger for the entire game, and it makes me cry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely difficult because we want you to be able to get that uh, obsidian rapier because it's really exciting when you do and it's super awesome. But at the same time, I've seen people review the game and say, oh, it's just all luck based because you just play over and over again until you finally get a weapon and you get carried by it, which makes me sad because it's definitely not luck based. You can beat the entire game with just the base dagger, of course, um, but, you know, we we still want you to have that feeling of finding something super awesome. If we made all the le all the weapons like even in in you know damage or ability, it would be pretty boring. The whole game would s feel bland. So it is it is difficult. I think our decision was probably the correct one. It sucks that some people think that it's that it's luck based, um, but yeah, I'm not sure if there's much we could we could do about it. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I feel like like our game and and maybe Dwarf Fortress, like even more so, is more about exploration rather than like overcoming a challenge. It makes it a lot easier to balance. No, we don't do because <laughs> it's <so>. not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we struggle. I mean, balance, but same thing. A var variance is very high because uh, in Darkest Dungeon, sometimes you assemble the right party, you go into the dungeon, you get a couple bad monster mash draws. We call them mashes. Uh, it's like an encounter. Um, <laughs> You know, and that can ruin, but we've actually built game mechanics. I, we, we didn't build me game mechanics around that problem. That problem problem is actually a feature because we want to constantly put you in a frame of mind of you can retreat. Like sometimes you do everything right and it doesn't work out and that is part of the game is to retreat. So, you know, but the variance, oh, it, it drives people crazy. And occasionally I'll be giving a demo. I remember another pack story, like someone from, you know, one of the big sites came by and they just, Every bad thing that could happen, you know, <laughs> RNG is hated, them. and you know, I, but that is, it's fair. That's the game experience. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you get lucky, mm -hmm. but but with variance comes the exciting moments, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you if you over tune it and it's bland, you have the bland problem again. Everything is perfectly suited to be just the right challenge. Like that's sometimes actually not fun. I think ultimately you just want it to be balanced enough. You have to stop caring after some point, and you mm -hmm. want that mix of skill and luck. Like Binding of Isaac is a good example where you can just luck out and pretty much just get a combo that'll let you win the game from the first floor. Mm -hmm. But people love that kind of stuff, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you've talked about it a couple times about uh, seeing through the tricks and like seeing the systems, feeling the systems, make, whether that makes it bland or difficult or, or however. Do you think that, I, I think it's fair to say that all of your games are kind of hard, um, <laughs> but then they become easy. Do you think that's an inherent pattern with all procedural games? Is there a way to solve it? Does it need solving? Yeah, like, is it bad? That yeah. if, if, you, if it didn't become easy for you, that would mean that the game was kind of unlearnable, or, or you, yeah, you, you'd be stop trying kind because of you, you're not progressing, right? So I think it needs to be like that. But yeah, like the, the rate at which you learn is, is something that, that can be tuned for sure. I mean, I think part of the reason why people love Dwarf Fortress is because it is it is so complex that it is beyond immediate comprehension. Like, you can understand the different parts of it at any given time, but, I mean, maybe you understand every single... Well, I, I mean, looking at my forum, everyone would just, oh, this game's too easy. That's <laughs> the whole... Yeah, so I, I definitely agree with that. I, mean, that's, I think that's the answer to it. It's, it's an unavoidable problem. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, I mean, multiplayer is totally different, right? If you have, like, a, some kind of multiplayer procedural mm. thing, then you can have the level of challenge like playing someone in chess, mm -hmm. right? So that's a different matter, but... but, but I think so it can yeah. still be um, too too hard at times. Like, I don't think Dwarf Fortress is too hard. Like, I think NetHack might be a little too hard because it's pretty <laughs> impenetrable to most new players. Like, a lot of people just bounce off it because... No, it's NetHack's just, too easy once yeah. you get used to it. Yeah, and then once, yeah but, but I think they made that beginning part too hard, but... All right, next. Um... I just wanted to know if you guys had any like other resources that you've used while you were developing your procedural games <laughs> to like inspire you that other people can learn from. Spelunky. <laughs> Stop making platformers, God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we were inspired by the the kind of old '80s games like Starflight and stuff. Um, that was really really neat. Um, they were way ahead of their time, uh, and like any button games, stuff like that. But when it comes to like resources to sort of learn things or so on, I know there's like a procedural wiki and so forth. I I mean, I don't I don't really. I'm not a very good programmer. I just don't look things up as much as I should. But there, there are. There's. There, I know there's a procedural content wiki, but mostly just you just just uh, look at other games and then plow ahead. Practices. It's just like playing an instrument or whatever. Practice is the most important thing. Just kind of dive into. Stuff. Yeah, for me, it's it's more the systems. Like again, I, I tend to try to 
make simpler systems so I'm, I'm not really necessarily looking up crazy algorithms unless there's a specific thing. It's more about like, oh, board game examples or past game examples that inspire me or even just books, like thematic books on what you're doing and the systems sort of like start forming. But so I think, but there are a lot of, you know, Gamma Sutra of course has some articles that people have posted on their blogs about, um, you know, because procedural generation has been pretty hot the last couple of years. Um, and so there's a lot more talk about it. There's a lot more articles written about it now than there were even a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the indie community is super friendly. Um, if, uh, my number one resource is always other indie developers. Um, so, like, you can get all of our email addresses, and, like, maybe we'll be crunching and we can't answer you, but uh, one of us might. <laughs> um, and, and really just playing each other's games and, and getting uh, inspired um, is really helpful for mm -hmm. me. Um, I was wondering if you guys had ever thought of uh, procedurally generated missions that would draw you to uh, particular um, procedurally generated obstacles. So um, I guess I pulled from Secret of Mana where you had to use a rope or like a whip or whatever to get over a, a cavern or you know, different items mm. uh, to do particularly different things like uh, burn a ice uh, oh, yeah, wall yeah. or something like that. Um, but kind of on the same note as you're uh, generating people or generating like character, I guess. Um, have the characters generate your own missions, but somehow so, those... So, succinctly, what is your question? Well, okay, sorry. So, basically, I just wanted to know if the NPCs, if, if you guys thought about NPCs that would generate mm. missions that were unique, I guess, is, is, is yeah, the you idea. Yeah, could, you could do that now. You could, um, someone's figured out, like, the key problem for getting, Did like... Did Rogue do that? I mean, I don't Bro remember. I, yeah, Rogue did yeah, do Rogue it. Yeah, Rogue had it, yeah. So, the problem here is, like, with Zelda Quest, the <laughs> items are basically keys that let you into new areas. Okay. And you know the the obstacles are doors that you need the keys for, and people have figured that out already. It's a solved problem. Oh, cool. I had I don't recall a game besides Brogue that's actually yeah, done that. Yeah, uh, yeah, it hasn't been fully explored or anything, but but it, 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 people are starting out. Just just uh, you you have spatially your your thing is represented your your whatever your game is, and then you can you can partition it into into kind of say numbered zones or something, and then you just make sure that things happen in the right order and then you can kind of have a list of tools that'd be kind of a simple starting approach and then you can just keep iterating and make it make it interesting but yeah people some people are interested in, and uh, you should see you, you might also want to check out yeah. academics on AI uh, there's a lot of interesting AI research being done that's completely separate from games they don't even consider them games um, and they're just like in a university toiling away on this really cool uh, needs generation engines and stuff so definitely go online okay thank you We have All eight right. minutes left, so we probably have like two or three questions. Okay, um, my name is uh, Shane. I'm a door fortress donor from Oklahoma City, and uh, I guess my question is more for the great Toadie one here, Tarn, um, because it, his game is really kind of unique in the fact that most of the developers here at PAX, they create a product, they sell a product, and they go on to create another product. Succinct so question, please. My question is, with door fortress being basically your career, you don't sell it. You survive on the charity of you know your very loyal users. Um, as you develop Door Fortress, uh, and it becomes more and more complex, is there a point in the development where it could become so complex that it becomes uh, like inordinately difficult to continue development on it? No, I don't think I don't think that's going to be a problem. Uh, this is this is the thing that we've kind of um, run into uh, in our graveyard of prior projects, which number in the hundreds. Uh, you you get used to adding. It's kind of like object oriented programming. You, you get used to adding a new system that plays nice enough with the other systems that design-wise, people aren't going to see, they're going to see less and less of the game, like a new player coming in, right, is going to see less and less of the game. But uh, things things will still work. I don't think it's going to fall apart for that reason. There, there are things like just the speed, right? Everyone knows who's played it about like frames per second problems and stuff like that. That's that's surmountable to a point and going, like we have memory problems too, we'll go to 64-bit and, and solve some of those, uh, hopefully. Um, but I, I think I think it's it's not not with the stuff that we have planned that just kind of adds new stuff like all this new art form and uh, and um, uh, kind of tech tree where your dwarves can kind of prove the Pythagorean theorem. Now, if someone make, makes uh, makes a library, they'll see it. If they don't make a library, they won't. Um, I mean, I, 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 I mean there there are problems with like the interface does the, like you get more options, more nesting, and it starts to feel you know a little. A little problematic, but I don't think it's certainly in the time I have left to work on it or whatever. I don't think it's going to be a, a huge problem. I think it'll be okay. Well, thank you. 
Uh, hi, my name is Glenn Pierce. I'm a software developer. Um, we talk a lot here about iterative functions and permutations and uh, layers upon layers of those. Do you guys see any benefit, especially you, Tanya, with the character development, personality development, with other sorts of equations therein involved, such as, but not like totally crazy here, neural networks or machine learning or something like that? Or is that like way outside of the bounds of a game, or is it going to be useless to the end user looking at the difference between that versus an iterative I mean, permutation. Yeah, the the tricky thing about the complex, like the, part of the appeal of Dwarf Fortress is the complexity is there, like it's in your face. It's not secretly behind a sheet. Like you you don't have to trust his word for it that it's really complex. Like you can see the complexity, and I think part of the the trick with people is that we're very complex and we're very opaque. Um, a lot of our complexities are very, very difficult to see on the surface. You have to really get to know someone to understand why they're a complex person. And I think not enough people are really exploring that space. Um, but I think there are a lot of different angles you could look at it. You could look at it from a more machine learning side. You could look at it from psychology. You could look at it from sociology. And I think, I, I hope you all do that because uh, they'll all be super different games. And the, the end user experience will be really different depending on what you're trying to achieve with your game. Thank you. I've, just a comment on that, I would say it's it's really good to take a step back and figure out what you're actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, and I think this is true with a lot of game development. I think there's a lot of people that start game projects that they're actually more interested in the technology. You know, they're they're trying to drive something forward, like they're interested in improving the performance of the whatever it is. And I think if you're um, there's no judgment on either side. But I think if your goal is actually to have a game system working that you're playing. Um, that you shouldn't be concerned with what is behind the scenes, you should be concerned with what the result is. And so there can be a temptation to, you know, to try to get up to speed on the latest development in computer mm. science on that when something that was done 30 years ago would work. You know, so it's, it's really a matter of, I think it's worth remembering what your goal is. Absolutely. I think there's a danger if you use things like neural networks that it can be too difficult for people, players, to actually comprehend what the heck is going on. Like we were talking about with NetHack possibly being too hard. If the, <laughs> if the people in your game are like too difficult for you to understand why they're behaving like that, then you might get... Like real people? Yes, exactly. <laughs> people don't want to play games to deal with real people. Just like <laughs> Tanya, you had mentioned um, that there are some modern board games that had uh, inspiring procedural generation and content. Um, what uh, are some of your favorite examples and, and if, if the other panelists have some suggestions? Sure. Um, my favorite example right now, I'm really obsessed with uh, Mysterium. Um, it's a dream. I don't know. Who's played Dixit? Dixit? Yeah? Okay, imagine those cards. Okay, it's, it's a game just about cards with really weird images. They're like really dreamlike. And so this Mysterium game uh, uses those to procedurally generate um, a, a murder mystery of sorts. And so the ghost has these, di these cards with weird images, and they're trying to tell the other players how they were murdered and by whom and where. And that's that kind of communication of like, like this, this whole mystery is being generated like as you're at the very beginning, and it's, and it's really, really interesting because all you have are these little cards and people, and you kind of map your own meaning onto like, well, like why is the rat on the cake the knife? Like, Right, and it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, I also really liked Eldritch. Um, Eldritch has some really interesting like hidden information underneath the, the status effects that's like, depending on whether or not you reveal uh, your debt. Uh, if you let your debt relapse, uh, you get different results. Um, and so it's, it's an very, very different each time. I recommend looking to Eldritch and Mysterium for sure. Any other recommendations? Cool, yeah. <laughs> So much like uh, using handcrafted content like in Spelunky, um, what challenges would you see or have you seen in using fan-designed uh, content for procedural generation? Oh, I haven't done that yet. I really want to get into having fans uh, do content and integrate that into a larger game. It's something I really want to get into. I'm not sure, have any games really done that successfully yet? Well, Unity... 
I, okay, so you can make mod content in Unity, and we were starting to do it. Sort of. But like, the complexity of having like our various event systems and the event triggers, mm -hmm. like it became super difficult. Like it would have added if, like a year of development. So yeah. uh, now you can you can change the skin on your characters. You can run around as Mega Man, <laughs> so that's kind of cool. <laughs> but no, I'm hoping for our next game for like Spies would be a great example of having people like feed secrets in and like really get users involved. Yeah, it's, it's a really cool idea and procedural generation where people can feed and um, make new content for a game. That's like big for my idea of a game that just lasts forever. Well, like it's Skyrim mods, all. Minecraft mods, like that's a huge yeah, part of I those games. Like success, Skyrim right? mods, except they support them a little better and yeah. the game was, uh, you know, you could just drop in content because it was randomly generated. Yeah, yeah, easy. exactly. But modding's different from actually incorporating into the game, for example. So like, for example, we're going to expose yes. a lot of modding hooks, but we wouldn't, for example, Dark Ascension wouldn't want to incorporate other than maybe the, the backer design stuff, random stuff getting put in. But it'd be interesting if Skyrim was the game, but as people are making it that instantly, the interface is like it gets hooked up and appears <laughs> in the same game that everyone else is playing, like as opposed to opting into the mod. Mm -hmm. yep. Be wild. I mean, I guess Spore was an example of a game with uh, <laughs> fan generated content. Right? Right? Generated the game, and you know what happened. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what happened? We, yeah. Well, <laughs> it was great. Doesn't yeah. okay. okay. Fortress have fan generated well, content? I mean, yeah, it depends on what you mean, because there's modding, right? Yeah. There's modding. Okay, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm being yelled at. Uh, we we got to stop it. It's six o'clock. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you very much. Have a great PAX. Nice. Awesome. We tried our best. That was fun, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Good yeah, job. That was really natural. That was fun. Yeah, the time passed real quick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know he was rambling too much. Hey.